Today, um, I'd like to introduce you to the inferential statistics. Um, as you probably know, many research rely on a single uh, sample, um, assuming that they're randomly drawn from the population with a handful number of patients, subjects, participants, cell lines, and so on. But if we think about it, why do people conduct their research with the sample? It is not like they are interested in the specific individuals in the sample, are they? Unless you are interested in very rare cases or phenomena on their own, the reason for studying a sample in general is not to learn about the individuals in the sample, but rather to infer certain population characteristics that the sample represents. So depending upon what you want to do with statistics, the goal of statistical analysis can be either uh, descriptive or inferential, where descriptive statistics is mainly about describing the sample characteristics by summarizing and visualizing to better understand the data collected and measured from a sample, which is what we have done so far in the exploratory data analysis. On the other hand, uh, the goal of, uh, goal of the inferential statistics um, is to make an inference about the population of which characteristic is represented by the sample. And understandably, one of the practical reasons why we study a sample is that the population is typically too big to study and we only have limited resources in terms of time and money. Typically, um, the size of a sample is only a tiny fraction of a population. And the question of inference uh, then is about quantifying our degree of confidence on um, how representative the sample is of the population. So let's consider the Scottish population, which is currently about five and a half million people. Here, the big N represents the number of population, not normal distribution. And the small N represents the size of the sample. Let's say that the population characteristic of potential interest here is the population glucose concentration level measured by a fasting um, blood glucose test where you measure the blood sugar level of someone without eating 10 to 16 hours prior to the measurement. And the goal is to come up with a single number that is representative of or typical of Scottish population. As we learned previously, um, an average or the mean can be one of the summary statistics we can use, but to calculate the mean, you need to know every single glucose concentration of all the members of population. And obviously it is not feasible to measure and record five and a half million glucose levels. So instead, what's done in practice, um, a small fraction of the population is sampled measure the glucose concentration of the sample and estimate the population's mean glucose concentration. For example, let's say um, that you have this sample of Scottish population with a size of 27. You can see that you know this is much doable to measure 27 glucose concentration instead of measuring five and a half million. Now we can calculate the mean of the sample, which turned out to be 100 milligram per deciliter. Now the question is, how much confidence do we have about the unknown population mean glucose level based on the sample statistics we have at hand? So that is the question of the inferential statistics. How do we estimate the population characteristics from the given samples, um, uh, from the given sample and quantify our 
uncertainty or certainty about the um, estimate we have at hand. So here, the statistics is a characteristic of a sample and X bar, um, as we have learned previously, represents sample mean. And the goal of the inferential statistics is to estimate the population parameter mu. So population parameter. So parameter is the characteristic of the population, whereas uh, statistics is the characteristic of the sample. Now, then the goal of the inferential statistics is to say something about the population parameter from the sample. And um, the parameter is typically um, denoted by these Greek letters. So mu represents population mean. The population mean when x bar is sample mean. Here we have the terms that we have used in the previous slides, and I'd like to have a brief definition of each of them here. So the population is a collection of all subjects, samples, or participants of interest. So in our example, um, our population was the people living in Scotland, and the parameter is a summary characteristic of the population, which in our case, it was the mean population glucose concentration of the people living in Scotland. And then from this population, we have a sample, which is a subset of the population of interest. So for example, say um, students from this RMPD class, um, you know, so you can be a subset of the population of interest even though it is not a random sample, um, technically speaking. And the statistics is a summary characteristic of the sample. So in this case, it is going to be the sample mean of the glucose level of the class. Uh, the subjects of this example are the individual students or humans. Um, and then finally, the variable is the glucose level, which is the characteristic of the sample and the population in the end that we are interested in. Intuitively, we can say that we will have a better estimate of the population mean if we increase the sample size and the sample mean will approach to the population mean uh, which will become the population mean when the sample size becomes the size of the population. So long time ago, some genius mathematicians thought about this relationship between the sample size and the accuracy of parameter estimation. So they thought, um, so they wondered if there is any lawful behavior of sample means of a certain size in relation to the true population mean, from which the random samples are drawn to show how close or far away the sample mean is to or from the true population mean that is unknown to us. It turns out when a large number of sample means are obtained from the randomly drawn samples of the same size from a population, the resulting distribution, which is known as sampling distribution of the means, shows some interesting mathematical properties that allow us to quantify how much confidence we have about our estimation of the population mean. So for the sake of illustration, let's pretend that we somehow know how the population distribution look like, which here is represented by the red curve. So here the population glucose level are uh, normally distributed with a mean of 100, right? 
a milligram per deciliter and a standard deviation of five milligram per deciliter. Now, imagine that we draw a thousand samples of size four from the population with replacement, meaning that after a member is selected at random from the population, it is returned to the population for the next sampling. So with replacement, there is still a chance for the first drawn member to be picked again. Now, each time we select four members, then we finish collecting a sample. For the sample, we measure each member's glucose level and calculate the sample mean. For example, here is our first uh, sample mean of 95. And done. Next, we draw another sample of four, measure the individual glucose level, and calculate the sample mean for that sample. For the second sample, uh, the mean is 100 mg per deciliter. So you repeat this procedure until you have thousandth a sample of four, of which mean is now 98. Of course, uh, each sample mean will be different from each other because every sample is composed of different members of population. Now you have collected thousand sample means. Um, that we can now construct a histogram of these sample means. So here is the result. Remember, our population was known to us and is represented by the red curve here. So this is the population distribution of glucose concentration. And the gray histogram is the histogram of that thousand sample means uh, of size four. So if we look at the histogram, it looks more or less normally distributed with its center um, on top of the population mean of 100, right? This black uh, vertical line represents the mean of this sampling distribution. So it is the mean of the sample means, not the mean of a sample, by the way. And another feature of the histogram is the smaller spread, uh, so which is this uh, you know, black horizontal line compared to the population distribution. It turns out uh, the standard deviation of the gray distribution, the sampling distribution, is smaller than the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. See? So um, here the mean is 100, and the standard deviation of the gray distribution is 5, which is the population standard deviation over square root of the sample size, which is 4. So it's a 5 divided by 2, right? And this becomes 2.5. So is it really true? Is, is it really the case that um, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution decreased by the square root of the sample size? So we're not sure about this. So we decided to change the sample size to 9. So the procedure is exactly the same except for the uh, different sample size. Now you take a sample of size 9 and measure the sample mean glucose level, put them back to the population, pick another sample of 9 and measure the sample mean glucose level. You do this um, for you know, basically the thousand, thousand times to collect thousand sample mean glucose concentration. And then um, you construct a histogram of the thousand sample means and see what happens. And voila, now the blue histogram is the distribution of the sample means of size 9. Uh, the mean of the histogram uh, is again um, on top of the population mean of 100, 
but the standard deviation got smaller than before by how much by the square root of the sample size of nine here right so now we run the same simulation with the sample size of 25 and as expected the mean of the yellow histogram right is the same as the population mean right which is represented by this vertical yellow line with a uh, again smaller standard deviation than the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size so now it's 5 divided by square root of 25 which will become 1 so as we can see if we increase the sample size to the infinity then the standard deviation of the histogram will approach to zero and the sample mean will become exactly the same as the population mean in a nutshell this is basically what came to be known as the central limit theorem so here is um, kind of a formal description of central limit theorem by laplace um, who actually um, rediscovered the central limit theorem so he's not the first one who actually um, uh, theorized it it was the de Mavoir um, who was the uh, predecessor of Laplace but um, he actually rediscovered it and then um, and organize it in his one of his um, publications so what the central limit theorem is a bit mouthful but I'll just uh, read it verbatim so when sample means each consisting of a sample size n randomly selected from a population are obtained from an unlimited series of random sampling with replacement and the resulting distribution of the sample means, also known as sampling distribution of the mean, will be approximately normal, normal as in normal distribution, regardless of the shape of the population distribution from which the samples are drawn as the sample size n increases. So according to the central limit theorem, a sampling distribution of the means uh, displays the following behaviors. So the mean of the sampling distribution, um, please note that this is not the individual sample means, will be the same as the population mean. So here the um, mu represents the mean of the sample means okay so here the data are sample means not the individual values okay and so if you have large enough um a lar la large um enough sample size then it'll approach to the population mean right so the mean of the sample distribution will be the same as the population mean so that's one of the properties of the sampling distribution and the other behavior of sampling distribution is that the standard deviation so here sigma represents the standard deviation of the sample mean x bar right equals to the population standard deviation so this is the population standard deviation right and divided by the square root of n, which is sample size. And this standard deviation of a sampling distribution of means, also known as standard error of the mean. So standard error of the mean, so standard error of the sample mean, um is um denoted as sem or sc for short and this is basically the standard deviation of a sample uh, uh that's of the sampling distribution and the size of the standard error 
will give you a measure of how precise your estimation of that population mean. So if you think about it, the standard deviation of a sample will provide how close uh, the data in the sample are to the uh, sample mean on average. However, to say something about the population mean from the sample mean, we need to know how close the sample mean is to the population mean. Um, and the standard error of the mean will provide us with that information. So the sample means will vary less from sample to sample by the square root of the sample size according to the central limit theorem. So what that means is that if you have a large sample size, then your estimation of the population mean will become more and more precise. Okay? But on the other hand, a large uh, standard error of the mean, SEM, means that your sample might not be very representative of the population. Another property of the sampling distribution is its uh, robust normality. So intuitively, if the sample, um, sample generating population is normally distributed, then you would think that the resulting sampling distribution will be normally distributed too. However, um, even if the population is not normally distributed, sampling distribution will be more or less normally distributed with reasonably large sample size. So here we um, say reasonably large. So uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, larger than 30 or more sample size. That's what we're talking about as a kind of a ballpark number. So here we have a um, simulation of the property um, where the top pinkish distribution is the original population from which uh, sample means will be generated. So obviously it is not normally distributed as you can see, but rather it looks more um, like an exponential distribution. So imagine that we simulate a central limit theorem using this population to see how the shape of the distribution, sampling distribution changes as a function of sample size. So on the left uh, is showing a sampling distribution constructed from thousands of sample means uh, with a size of five drawn from that top distribution. And as is obvious, the, uh, the shape of the sampling distribution um, does not look very normal, but positively skewed, or the skew to the right. But as we increase the uh, sample size to 30, and the resulting sampling distribution in the middle looks more or less normal with a slight, a slight positive skew. And finally, as the sample size increased to 100, and the sampling distribution on the right looks almost normal. So um, if our sample size is large enough, say over 30, then we can assume that, that the sampling distribution not the individual samples will be approximately normal and what and what that means is that all the properties of normal distribution will apply to this sampling distribution so for example uh, we know that the true population mean will be located somewhere within plus or minus two standard error of the mean of the sampling distribution which is um, so the two standard error of the mean is basically the standard deviation of the sampling distribution uh, given the sample mean and the size. So when the sample means not the sample data follow normal distribution with a population mean of mu and the standard error of the mean then it can be standardized using the Z-transformation as we learned before. Because the uh, standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of sampling distribution 
uh, then all the properties of normal distribution are applied to this distribution too, such as 95% of the sample means will fall around the population mean. So here, um, you know, you have to just to be careful about this one. So X bar, when X bar follows the yeah, normal distribution with the mean of the population mean, right? And then this sigma over square root of n is the standard deviation of sampling di distribution, right? So this is the standard deviation of the sampling means, distribution of the sampling means, which is known as standard error of the mean, right? So that's SEM. And we can standardize by subtracting the sample means, so which is our data now, from the population mean and divide this by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean, which is the um, standard error of the mean. Right? Then it will. So we can find, so this is a plus minus one standard error of the mean, and you will find 68% in the middle. And within plus minus two standard deviation, that uh, you can find the 95%. Okay, so. That will become 95%, 95, and so on. And within plus minus two, a three standard error of the mean, you will find 99.7%. And especially, you know, this interval within plus minus two standard error of the mean is known as. 95% confidence interval. So here the CI um, stand for confidence interval. Um, so this was first suggested by a um, statistician named Jersey Neiman in 1937 to report as a metric indicating how accurate our estimate of the population mean will be given the sample mean and the size. So the uh, confidence interval is an observed boundary from the sample within which the unobserved parameter, so in, in, this case, uh, in this case population mean, would fall with a given confidence level. And in practice, we report our sample mean as our estimation of the population mean along with the confidence interval to express the amount of certainty or uncertainty in the estimation. And um, you can use different levels of confidence, but 95% is the uh, most commonly used confidence level. So in practice, um, it is a quite um, quite a standard procedure to report 95% confidence interval along with the uh, sample mean. And it is not that difficult to calculate, as you can see from uh, the um, simple equation. So the lower boundary um, of the uh, any percent level, yeah, so given level of confidence, the lower boundary of the confidence interval is x bar, which is a sample mean that you measure it, minus the z, this is kind of uh, the uh, confidence level you're going to use. And most commonly used confidence level is 95%, right, uh, which correspond to the z score of 1.96 or, you know, round it up to 2. And you multiply this by standard error of the mean which is basically the standard deviation of the sample and then square root of n. So that's, um, so because you don't know the population standard deviation, right? You 
use the sample standard deviation instead, uh, as if this is the population mean. I mean population standard deviation. Sorry, and then you divide this by the square root of the sample size that uh, of your sample, right? So that is the lower boundary, and the upper boundary is just to add this amount right to the sample mean. Then you will have the upper boundary of um, the confidence interval. So for the 95% confidence interval, it is basically sample mean plus minus two standard error of the mean, right? So that's all there is to it. And given the same level of confidence interval, say you have um, two sample means, and then you calculate the 95% um, confidence interval for both uh, sample mean. And if you have wider confidence interval, that indicates your sample mean is less um, representative of the population mean. On the other hand, if you have narrower confidence interval, right? then that means uh, your estimation of the population mean from the sample mean is quite accurate. Okay, so this is almost like a rhetorical problem, but if you have a large confidence interval, that means you're not very confident. If you have you know, small, small confidence level, then that means um, you are confident about your estimation. Okay. And also, given the same sample mean, um, if you increase the uh, the confidence level, say from 95% to 99%, then obviously your confidence interval gets larger, wider, right? Given the same sample mean. Because so you become more conservative about um, your estimation by increasing the level of confidence. Okay. So, um, mm, oh, right. And it is also common to report plus minus one standard deviation instead of a 95% confidence interval along with the sample mean. Uh, but if you do that, uh, then it has actually slight, slightly different um, meaning compared to the confidence interval. So they serve kind of different purposes uh, and that, you know, many people are not very attentive to. So if you want to indicate the average variability of the data or observations in the sample, then you will use standard deviation. On the other hand, if you want to indicate the uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty you have in the estimation, of the unknown population mean, then you will report the confidence interval. Now let's work with um, some example um, to show how to calculate the 95% confidence interval. So let's say that we have a sample of 25 and we measure the um, individual glucose concentration and it turned out to be 100 milligram per deciliter as a mean, the sample mean, and the standard deviation as 5 milligram per deciliter. So to calculate the lower boundary first, so the lower boundary is x bar minus z times standard error of the mean, which is um, standard deviation. So in, in this case, we do not know the um, population standard deviation. So we're going to use sample standard deviation. <clears throat> so that's 100 minus and the Z star, we're going to just round it up value, which is two times five over square root of 25. Right? So square root of 25 is 5, so that's 5, 5, 1. So basically the lower boundary is 98, 100 minus 2, right? And upper boundary, 
same it's just plus z star times square root i mean the sigma over square root of n 100 minus 2 times 5 over square root of 25 so that's 102 so that, so that is the upper boundary of the 95 percent confidence interval now we can draw a bar graph with an arrow bar using this 95% confidence interval. So um, this is how to create an arrow bar with 95% confidence interval. You first erect a bar that should be the size, the height of which should be the mean of uh, the sample. And then you add the vertical bars uh, above and below the mean. So the upper boundary was 102, right? And this horizontal stopping bars are optional, right? You don't have to have that, but this is to facilitate the reading of each boundary. So that's upper boundary and this is lower boundary. So the upper boundary was 102 and the lower boundary was 98. So this is how you draw a, a, a bar graph with an arrow bar, and this is how uh, other statistical software draw an arrow bar.